and they don't believe that the others that are running can effectuate the change because they had a chance. They've had 20 years. Six-term Congresswoman Karen Bass. Our city is in a crisis. We're at a crossroads. This is a fight for the soul of our city. Her early lead, chased by Caruso, and his ability to buy millions of dollars in campaign ads. You can spend a truckload of money, but at the end of the day, it's about the power of the people. Still in the race, L.A. City Councilman Kevin DeLeon. Also critical of the role that money is playing in this primary. You know, do we have a multi-billionaire, you know, buying the election who won't debate on the issues, you know, making promises that, quite frankly, I know through vast experience, he's not going to be able to keep. Another hotly contested race, L.A. Sheriff. Well, the political establishment wants to wants to basically take the independence of the office of sheriff. Sheriff Alec Villanueva facing a crowded field after a first term of battles with the Board of Supervisors. So they were the ones busy recruiting everyone possible and their mother to run against me. It all comes down to who actually turns out and turns in a ballot. And thank you for joining us tonight on NBCLA.com and our NBCLA app. I'm Chuck Henry. And I'm Colleen Williams. We're also streaming live on Peacock, Roku, Fire TV, Apple TV, and Samsung Plus TV. And here with us tonight, NBC4 political reporter to my right, Conan Nolan, and NBC4 political analyst, Dr. Anj Marie hancock Alfaro. They are here to help break down all the numbers tonight, the races, and definitely the impact on our neighborhoods. The polls closed at 8 o'clock, and we're going to take a quick look at the first batch of results just coming into our team. And here we have, and first of all, we're going to take a look at these uh, statewide races. There you see uh, Democrat Alex Padilla, who is running to uh, keep his uh, seat as U.S. Senator representing California. Sizable lead right now, but obviously these are very early returns. And I think we have one for the governor's race as well. We can take a quick look at that. Once again, we want to remind everyone these are very early numbers. Uh, we will definitely update these there it is. the evening. Gavin Newsom, 59%, over Brian Dahl, 17%. Now, we also want to tell you that as these numbers come in, what you're going to see is you're going to see the percentages on the bottom of your screen. That represents the percentage of votes that we have. That's what that, that will be always tonight, the percentage of votes. The first batch that will come in tonight will be those that voted by mail or those that uh, absentee ballots, that kind of thing will come in first. The actual vote on the day of the election today won't come in until a bit later. And most of these early returns are going to be for the county of Los Angeles. And of course, we're going to hear from Conan and Dr. Anjumri in just a minute. But first, we're going to go to NBC4's Beverly White. She's with the Karen Bass campaign in Hollywood. Uh, Beverly, has a congresswoman arrived? What's the uh, feeling there tonight? Well, there was good music from the DJ a short time ago. She turned it down to accommodate those of us who were trying to report here live. But the crowd thus far is a bunch of, as you like to say, civilians, people who've been supporting Karen Bass since her early days with the Community Coalition and the State Assembly and followed her ascension to the U.S. House of Representatives, where she has served, as you mentioned, for six terms. She's not here yet. She's not expected to arrive until long after the results are counted. Uh, right now, of course, it's just moments after 8 o'clock when the polls close. She's not here yet. Not due to appear, we're told, between maybe 9, 9.30. But the crowd is starting to assemble. Like I said, there's a DJ in the house. There's a food and drink. and It's plenty spacious for the time being. And in these times of COVID, that's a significant concern. They're checking people as they enter for vaccination status. So um, I made the cut. Proud to rock my wristband so I'm legit I can stay but it's uh, so far a slow burn expected to be uh, raucous and celebratory in the moods of her staff obviously because they do believe she's going to prevail tonight or at least give Mr. Caruso a run for his quote unquote money she's not here but she is expected at any time within the next hour maybe 90 minutes or so Thank you, Beverly. We'll see if Robert Kavasik has one of those bands, too. And I still want to tell you, still, we don't have any votes in from Los Angeles County yet. Robert Kavasik is live out there with the Rick Caruso campaign at the Grove. Robert. Well, Chuck, let me explain to you what's going on in the Grove right now. It may be deceiving behind me here at the Grove, where they have this whole area cordoned off, where you see the podium there behind me. 
and that's right behind the fountain if you've been to the Grove before. Now, it may look empty here behind me, but then Alex will just uh, pan over to your right, and Alma Restaurant right now is hosting the actual party, and then they will come out here when Caruso speaks. Now, according to City Council Member Joe Buscaino, who I just talked to, he said Buscaino is here at the Grove. He is with his family in his office here at the Grove, watching the returns come in. Make no mistake, there are plenty of people right now filling that restaurant and now going to spill their way out onto this grassy knoll here as they wait for Caruso to eventually take the stage. He is waiting apparently for more numbers to come in, but according to the council member who we just spoke to, these first batch of numbers, Chuck and Colleen, according to this campaign, is really going to be the mandate, they say. This is going to influence how the rest of the night goes. And you just hear the announcement that they're welcoming people to the Grove, welcoming people to this election night party that is just underway. We're live here at the Grove. I'm Robert Kavostek. We'll see you soon. All right, Robert, you mentioned they're waiting for uh, an update on numbers, numbers to come in. We're waiting for any numbers to come in. It's 836 at this point. Uh, Dr. Ange Marie, have you ever seen them come this late from L.A. County? Well, usually, you know, Dean Logan and his team have things running like clockwork. Um, we didn't see a lot of long lines today, but I'm suspecting that they're going to need to get those ballots from the drop boxes and every place else. Um, and so hopefully they will get those numbers to us as soon as possible. And as we go over to Conan, in just a second, if we can call up the L.A. County numbers, because we do have some numbers in the race for sheriff right now. Okay, I guess we don't have those numbers. So let me ask you, Conan, what are you expecting to see tonight? Well, let's uh, uh, point to the fact that um, more people vote in the race for sheriff of Los Angeles County than in the race for governor in 42 states. Mm. So when we talk about L.A. County and Dean Logan, it is a Herculean effort mm -hmm. because there is no county close to the kind of election operation that they have at L.A. County, which is frequently in the past why they have been late on occasion. It's just colossally difficult. Well, and in the that. past, too, uh, they, the, the numbers have been late because sometimes they chopper these these ballots right. in, yeah. and, and right. then mm -hmm. they run into inclement weather. I, you know, I don't right, know the right, weather right, exactly. I remember but, the days, yeah, because oh, yeah. North County, they'd have to truck it in, uh, you know, Lancaster and Palmdale. So, got it. it. It's just, it is, it's a major operation. We it's frequently right. compare L.A. County to all the other counties. It's unfair. 25% uh, of the entire state lives in this county alone. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you something that Robert Kavasik brought up, who's at the Rick Caruso campaign headquarters there at the Grove. He said, according to him, the campaign is counting on the first numbers to come in will really set the tone for the night. Do you believe that that's the way it's going to happen? Yeah, I, I, I possibly. Let's not lose sight of the fact that this is the elimination round. This is the prelim. Mm -hmm. The big vote is in the fall. Uh, we're going to find out who the top two finishers are. And I think he, both Karen Bass and Rick Caruso will claim victory regardless of where they end that's up. Right. Uh, because it's all about making the cut, and then they will make the final pitch uh, for November, and they got a long time to make that. So there we have the L.A. County Sheriff numbers that we're referring to just a moment ago, and there you see slim lead there for the current sheriff, Alec Villanueva, and Robert Luna, uh, second right now, right now, and Eric Strong in a third place right now. But obviously these are very, very early numbers, and once again, this is the percentage of the votes, so you know what we're measuring them against, okay? Right. And uh, so about that, Alex Villanueva, remember when he ran against Jimmy uh, McDonald uh, four years ago, uh, Sheriff McDonald came that close That's to winning in June, mm -hmm. just barely didn't make. So when we, we look at this number tonight, it'll be a long haul for him to get past 50 percent. Uh, they'd all love it, of course. Certainly the sheriff would. But it's a whole new ball game once you have a one opponent. Right now he's got, what, seven or eight. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Marie, the one thing we heard from the um, uh, Caruso camp tonight, uh, he said people are tired of excuses. He really ran on a safety issue, not only homeless, but safety. People are afraid to walk outside their homes. Is that something that appears to have resonated with voters? I mean, think back to March and some of the polls when he was single digit. Granted, he spent a lot of money on mm -hmm. campaigning, mm -hmm. but 
This is something that resonated with voters? I think this is something that resonated with voters across the mayoral and the sheriff's race, right? So I'm going to be tracking this idea of crime and how people feel safe. Um, and again, if Villanueva and Caruso kind of track together in the results, we'll see that Caruso's strategy was effective, not just for him, but also for Sheriff Villanueva as well. Um, if there's a split there or a divide, then we'll see probably Caruso's investment wasn't quite as much of a return on his investment as it was for Villanueva. There's a, there's a lot of money, I should say, that Rick Caruso spent on research long before he got in the race. Those two issues had to hit a certain mark for him to jump in. Mm -hmm. And his people say they were, they were astonished as to how much they, how, how, how high they, they scored on those two issues. Let me Rick Caruso both, wouldn't be running if it weren't for those. Is there a possibility that Canada can actually overspend, have too much airtime? Well, I, I certainly can say anecdotally that can definitely happen. Um, and so I know Conan and I were talking last night about Meg Whitman. <laughs> That's certainly one example of someone potentially overspending. Um, but also you can think about whether or not that ends up having diminishing returns going forward, right? That you've defined yourself, but you also don't have a lot of way to respond going forward in terms of attacks or other kinds of things, because the media is going to now start to do their research on Caruso a lot more than they have when there were many more candidates. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I do think, though, that, yeah, there's comes to a point where if you've seen the ads and I, in, a, in a rotation, a heavy, heavy rotation, then you get the mailer, and then you've on, and you get not one but a dozen mailers, mm -hmm. then you have the radio, you do saturate, and I think there's a potential. I think, as we mentioned last night, Meg Whitman spent so much money, as some believe she became the incumbent. She became the establishment candidate. Rick Crusoe does not want to be considered the establishment candidate. So what do you candidate. do then going forward? Do you hold back until the fall and start anew, assuming that he is, in fact, one of the top contenders here? And the same question for Karen Bass. Yeah, well, I think, you know, you definitely want to reserve your time for the fall, mostly because you're not going to get, especially for someone like Rick Caruso, who spent so much money, a lot of bang for your buck right now. And we have the first numbers in the mayor's race right now. Remember, this is the percentage of the votes that are in, and you can see Rick Caruso there with a very slight three-point margin over Karen Bass and Kevin DeLeon with 7%. And the 7% on the Kevin DeLeon, you know, he has been in third place through much of this campaign. I guess the question has been, Conan, you know, what kind of a performance at all is he going to make? Here's a guy who is, you know, uh, president pro tem of the Senate. You know, he's come a long way. You know, not to diminish what he has done uh, as, a, as a political figure. He was uh, responsible for the Senate bill that increased the gas tax and spent a uh, billions of dollars on transportation projects, and he's had several other uh, high-profile pieces of legislation. Uh, but frankly, people don't pay a lot of attention to the California legislature. So, um, so he's sort of a new for many of them. He's sort of new, um, a, a new name. He's been in the city council on the city council for less than two years, and so um, it, I think it may have been asking a lot. Uh, some might argue, wouldn't be me, but um, that that he, he might have spent a little more time on the council. Um, you know, he says he's made progress on homelessness. Uh, I remember Antonio Villaraigosa did the same thing. He ran, got on a city council, then immediately ran for mayor. Um, and I think um, some thought then he should have just waited a little bit. You know, it's interesting. We do have some of the latest numbers. 28% of the vote counted so far. Alex Padilla, the U.S. Senate race. Uh, interesting, when you went through the ballot, you had to vote twice for this particular race. Uh, Dr. Anjemarie, can you explain why? Sure. Uh, well, we had to vote twice if you were going to vote for Alex Padilla, but you had to vote twice in that race. In that right? race. Um, because uh, when we had the 2020 election, Senator Kamala Harris right, was elevated to vice president mm -hmm. through that election. So Governor Newsom appointed Alex Padilla for the remainder of her term, but then had to be voted on f to be able to serve for the remainder of her term. And also, there is an open seat, right? So there's kind of these two different ways in which he's got to get elected. Why don't we ask the senator how he feels about that? We have Alex Padilla with us live right now. Thank you, Senator, for joining us. Uh, it, maybe you can comment on what uh, Dr. Ange Marie just said here about the fact that you're actually having to run twice. 
Yeah, well, good to see you, Chuck. Uh, hi, Thank Colleen. You. Hope you're Hello. well. And uh, please say hi to uh, Conan for me. Uh, it's a little bit later here in Washington. The Senate is in session this week, so I'm joining you uh, live from Washington, D.C. Uh, but yes, it was, a, it was a challenge for our campaign to communicate to voters, not just vote for Alex Padilla once, but twice. The first vote, the special election, uh, is for the balance of the term. The governor's appointment was not for the full balance of uh, now Vice President Harris's term, but only in until the next election, which is this one. And so we need one vote from the voters from the election to the end of the term, and then a separate vote for the next full six-year term. So uh, that's why you get a chance to vote for Alex Padilla twice. And I'm just so grateful that so many Californians have done exactly that. Uh, onwards to November, the campaign continues, and more importantly, the work continues. For people in the state, they know that you were the uh, 32nd Secretary of State. So I want to pick your brain a little bit about that. How does the potentially low turnout, which we seem to be seeing, impact things for the general election here? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I mean, a little disappointed. We always wish that was 100% uh, participation. But California, at least, you can't blame voter suppression laws on the turnout that we're seeing. We, uh, over the years, have made it safer and easier, more convenient for eligible voters to register uh, and to cast your ballot, make sure it's counted. Uh, but we know times are tough right now. We're still uh, grappling with the, the, the COVID pandemic, maybe not from an infection rate and people on ventilators, but uh, the numbers are up. People are worried about that. We've been dealing with it for two years, concerns about the inflation and increasing costs in, in a number of areas. And so these are the issues that all candidates at all levels of government uh, have to to directly address with voters. I know I'm going around the state talking about the plans we have in the Senate to lower the cost of prescription drugs, uh, to restore the child tax credit and uh, underwrite child care, uh, to address the housing and homeless issues through significant federal investments and partnership and those sorts of things. So, you know, if we let people know we, we see you, we hear you, we have ideas on how to make life better and then follow through on that, I think uh, Democrats are gonna be just fine in November. Do you think Democrats and Republicans on another subject are going to get together on some kind of gun control action? You know, I'm glad you asked because it's uh, obviously a, a timely issue, but it's uh, personal for me because as a father of three school-aged children, uh, my heart just broke when uh, we saw the incident in Uvalde recently, and I got flashbacks to uh, Newtown, Connecticut, almost mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Uh, so I can report this. Uh, conversations as recently as today with uh, uh, Senator Chris Murphy, the lead in negotiations on the Democratic side, uh, and separately, conversation meeting I had today with uh, Senator Senator Cornyn from Texas. Uh, I am optimistic that we will get something done. Unfortunately, it won't be everything that we need to get done. California is a gold model. You know, we've banned assault weapons. We've banned large capacity magazines. Uh, we have strong background check requirements. And as a result, lower rates of mass shootings in California than other states where it's far too easy to obtain uh, a weapon and, and an assault rifle, especially. Uh, so uh, it seems like there's building consensus on strength and background checks, uh, incentivizing states for, uh, you know, red uh, uh, flag warnings uh, and investing in mental health, all important. So I think we take that, we make progress, uh, but we continue to advocate for restoration of the federal assault weapons ban that stood in place for 10 years and saved a lot of lives. The evidence is clear, the data is compelling, uh, and we're going to keep uh, working towards that. Senator, to Chuck's point about working together, you've spent some time in Washington at this point. Your impression of getting things done and, and having both Republicans and Democrats come together. Yeah, uh, it's uh, look, it's, it's hard, <laughs> but it needs to be done. And it doesn't happen without putting effort into it. Uh, the first uh, bipartisan bill that I introduced last year, uh, we, we labeled the Power On Act, and it was inspired not just by the ice storms in Texas that uh, took out the electrical grid, but frankly, my experience serving as chairman of the State Senate Committee on Energy and Utilities once upon a time, because you know how wildfires threaten uh, keeping the light on in California. So we found bipartisan ground to invest federal dollars with working with states and utilities to improve not just the reliability of the electrical grid, but the resiliency of the electrical grid because climate change is real. Uh, and 
Uh, it was included in the bipartisan infrastructure package signed by the president last fall. Uh, so it can be done. Uh, it takes effort. Uh, I just wish we had a similar uh, success to report at this point on criminal justice reform, more on climate change, immigration reform, voter protections, and uh, a whole lot more. Senator, stay right there. I know Conan's got a question for you, but here's something I think you'll enjoy. The, the man who uh, nominated you, put you in there. As Senator, has, we're declaring him the victor right now. Gavin Newsom there with 60% of the votes that are in right now. So uh, that's the way it's going to turn out there. We're predicting it's Gavin Newsom. No surprise, I'll bet, Senator. Uh, no, not really a surprise. I mean, in many ways, it's a continuation of the debate that we had uh, last year during the uh, failed recall effort. Uh, I think most Californians appreciate uh, Governor Newsom's leadership uh, for what it is. I mean, the governor and the legislature, frankly, have been uh, very progressive and has served as a model for national policy uh, on environmental protection, on increasing access to health care, on how we support our immigrant communities, uh, and a whole lot more. So, so uh, let's uh, continue to support this leadership and, and continue to make progress. Senator, we have to ask you about gas prices and inflation. I don't know uh, the last time you were back in the state, but it's quickly approaching $7 a gallon in L.A. County. What can lawmakers in Washington, what are they doing about that? Yeah. Uh, I was home as recently as just yesterday, Colleen, just so okay, you know. Okay, then you know. Uh, you know. Campaigning up until the last minute and took a red eye to Washington. So, yes, I know, as, not just as a senator, uh, but as a husband and as a father, whether it's uh, you know three growing boys at home, so buying the next gallon of milk or buying the next dozen eggs or, or meat at the grocery store, but especially at the gas pump. And here's what uh, should be offensive to all of us. At the same time as we are seeing record gas prices, the oil companies are recording record profits, right? That's offensive. What they're doing is exploiting the situation with uh, Putin's uh, attack on Ukraine being all over the news. They're using it as a justification to raise prices unnecessarily. Uh, and so I am supportive of efforts at the federal and at the state level to tax these windfall profits uh, by oil companies and uh, re return them in the form of stipends to uh, working families that are uh, paying these prices at the pump. I mean, that's, that's just for starters. Uh, Senator, can I quick ask if we can go to camera three real quick? Um, <laughs> nice to see you. I know it's late. It's almost midnight in Washington. Uh, you are a... Uh, you share the responsibility of representing the nation's largest state in Washington with Dianne Feinstein, who is mm -hmm. 88. Uh, there have been a number of articles recently about what, they, what has been contended to be her diminishing uh, cognitive ability. Recently, just the other day, there was a very, very unflattering picture of her on the cover of New York Magazine where they made the argument that she does not have the capacity to represent uh, California in the U.S. Senate uh, and that there has been a significant decline uh, in her cognitive skills and her understanding of policy. Can you tell us definitively, your office deals with her office, you deal with her. I'm just interested in your reaction when you see these articles out of the San Francisco Chronicle, New York Magazine and elsewhere uh, relating to the ability of Dianne Feinstein to do her job. Yeah, look, uh, I, I hear the chatter as well, Connor. And, but here's what I can tell you. You know, I see Senator Feinstein multiple times a week, whether it's on the floor of the Senate, uh, casting votes, in between votes, whether it's in Democratic caucus that uh, convenes a couple of times a week, or even the Judiciary Committee, where we're both members. She's getting the job done, and her office is getting the job done. So uh, that's my observation. That's uh, my observation up close uh, and personal. Uh, um, you know, but I hear, I hear the chatter. I hear what you're saying. I think it's unfortunate because uh, she's still delivering for California. All right, Senator Alex Padilla, as Conan pointed out, it's late in D.C. We certainly appreciate your time and your expertise tonight. All right, I get to call home now and uh, say goodnight to the kids and uh, try to get some uh, shout out myself. Get ready All for right. tomorrow. Good enough. Take care. Thank Good you, night, Senator. Senator. Appreciate it. Let's take a look. We've got some new updated numbers here in the race for Los Angeles County Sheriff, kind of boiling down to a two person race, kind of much what we thought here. The current sheriff, Alec Villanueva, 31 percent of the votes that so far have been cast. And you can see the totals in the really small numbers next to the percentage marks against the uh, Long Beach Sheriff, Robert Luna. Our John Caddis, uh, clean back. Yes, Cleanback is live in East L.A. at a watch party for the incumbent sheriff, 
Alex Villanueva. John. Yeah, guys, the sheriff has said that he's going to come out and uh, say some words once some more numbers come in. As you saw, uh, as of right now, the early numbers that are coming in shows him in the lead with uh, his uh, challenger, Robert Luna, out of Long Beach, coming in pretty close right now with those numbers. I want to show you some video earlier uh, as the sheriff made his way in here, making an, an, uh, an appearance, almost like a hero's welcome as he walked in. Of course, all of his supporters here uh, backing him. This is a very different sheriff than what we saw three and a half years ago. Uh, he ran on a platform of progressive reform, but uh, a lot a lot of people say that he's changed in the way that uh, he's governed as a sheriff. So now there are some other people who have decided they want to step up against him. There are a total of nine candidates in this race. The, one of them is former Long Beach Police Chief Robert Luna, endorsed by the LA Times. He became the chief in Long Beach after Jim McDonald left to become the LA County Sheriff before Villanueva. Now Luna has promised to reduce crime and modernize the jails while restoring public trust. So from his home in Long Beach, he told us this afternoon that he's ready if the this race turns into a runoff. Uh, I'm in this race right now, and I'm approaching it like I'm in last place. Uh, and then we'll see where the where the numbers end uh, tonight. So, you know, he's down with his family right now in Long Beach, uh, watching those numbers come in, certainly, and the sheriff here as well, keeping an eye on what's coming in as those numbers start to roll in faster and faster throughout the night. We're going to keep you up guys. We'll send it back to you. John Caddis Klimak, thank you. Tonight, we are also tracking a few of, well, the more competitive congressional races. That's right. Carolyn Johnson is at the NBC4 Election Plaza, and she has more on that. Carolyn. Yeah, Chuck, Colleen, Conan, and Anj Marie, we are doing that. We're keeping track of these competitive congressional races here in our area. And some of these races made even more interesting by the recent redistricting. As you know, every 10 years, the census data is used to redraw districts based on population change. And for the first time, California has lost a congressional seat. That in turn has led to some new boundaries for our local districts. This is a good example of this. This is the newly formed District 42. You can see it actually has a big swath of Long Beach. It also includes Downey, Bell Gardens, Bellflower, and Lakewood. And you see here on the map, Catalina is part of this as well. Now this is actually quite different from what the district, uh, the 42nd district was before. We have another map that indicates what that was. Uh, if we can show the there's a there it is in gray there if you look to your right it says district 42 so what happened here was it gets confusing right because we not only changed the way that boundaries were drawn and in many cases district numbers changed as well so what we're talking about now is what you see in yellow this is now an open seat with no incumbent more than half of the residents in this newly drawn 42nd district are Latinos who are eligible voters. This district represents the Port of Long Beach and the rail yards. And Mayor Robert Garcia is considered one of the front runners. And as you see right now, with 28% of the votes coming in, he does have about 49% here. You also see the Republican John Briscoe trailing slightly behind. Christina Garcia, another one to watch in this race. She is the Democratic Assemblywoman. And remember, it's the top two finishers who advance to the general election in November regardless of party. We will, of course, take a look at some of the other competitive congressional races, and that's coming up in just a bit. Chuck and Colleen, back to you. All right, thank you. Let's uh, talk about District 42, if I could, with uh, Dr. Anjumarie. Sure. Uh, you really see uh, the, the lead there. Robert Garcia, um, mayor of Long Beach at one point, mm -hmm. um, he's been considered sort of a fast burner within the Democratic Party for a long time. Yes, he is definitely seen as a rising star in the Democratic Party. Um, very active statewide in terms of California politics, but also was very active in the last presidential election. He was an early um, kind of supporter of Joe Biden before he earned the nomination. Um, so he is definitely seen as an up and comer. Um, and also, I think, you know, people in Long Beach thought he was a popular mayor for some of the things that he was able to do in terms of his response to to the pandemic, which kind of got nationwide applause. Um, his response on immigration in terms of, you know, being able to take some of those unaccompanied minors in and not just like house them, but give them take books, care of them. teach them, give them medical care, things like that. So he's definitely an up and comer to watch. Yeah, keep in mind that in the top two primary system that we have in here in California, it, it's rare. Uh, most states don't have anything like it. If you're Robert Garcia and you're a Democrat, the last person you want to run <laughs> off 
against and then is another Democrat. Right. That's right. With so, the same last name. Well, not to mention the same <laughs> last name. And so uh, we've gotten to the point, this is a, a little bit of a dogleg here, but um, where some Democrats, Rob Bonta did this, will actually try to increase the profile of a Republican that they know they can beat in the fall mm -hmm. so that they will finish second in the primary, if you follow me. Uh, Gavin Newsom did that when Antonio Villaraigosa was running against him for, for governor. He didn't want to run against him in the fall, so he made sure a Republican, who was unacceptable to most voters, would be the guy, the person he ran off against. We're just looking at some new numbers coming in in the L.A. mayor's race. Uh, they haven't changed significantly, you see, with Actually, roughly 12%, uh, 41%, 38 7%. Um, is this pretty much what everyone expected? It's certainly what I would expect in terms of who generally casts their votes early, right? So who votes by mail early, but also who shows up at the vote centers early. Um, we know that younger voters, we know that um, what we call low propensity voters, which are often poorer communities of color, tend to show up later in the process um, than folks who are kind of don't have anything else to do, and so we're going to take a trip to the vote center someday, you know, during the week, right? So people work, people have child care commitments and all kinds of things that prevent them from getting to it until sometimes at the last minute. So those folks um, were going to be more likely to be Caruso voters slightly, um, mostly because they tend to be, again, older perhaps whiter, um, perhaps more conservative, or really looking for um, engaging in this way. It'll be yeah. interesting to see how it breaks down geographically. We, we don't have that right now, no. but mm -hmm. his, his base seems to be in the San Fernando Valley, uh, older, to your point, doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, she gets a lot of white liberals out of the west side, sort yeah. of the Bradley coalition. Mm -hmm. uh, South, South Los Angeles, although the poll out of the uh, UC Berkeley Institute of Governmental Studies talked about how African-American men are split almost evenly between her and Rick Caruso. Does which that is have anything to do with the endorsement that Rick Caruso got from Sweet Alice and or Snoop Dogg? Certainly doesn't hurt. Same yeah, I, and you know, endorsements are always kind of iffy in terms of their impact in the final analysis. Um, but I certainly think that poll um, that showed kind of black men um, certainly We'd probably want to look into that data a little bit more to see how many black people we're talking about in general um, before we make extensive generalizations. Which of these two candidates? And we've got some late governor uh, numbers. It's still the same. We're, Gavin Newsom is going to win this, and his margin over uh, Brian Dahl is now increased somewhat. He's picked up another percentage point there. He's now at 61 percent. Who is favored by a large or small voter turnout in the mayor's race? Uh, I would say Caruso would be favored by a smaller turnout. So when you have a small turnout, then the people that turn out are mad. They're, 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 mm -hmm. they're enthused or they're just pissed off. That's why midterm elections normally go to the party out of power, right. which is right. Republicans, it's a, almost a sure bet you will have Speaker Kevin McCarthy or there will, Republicans will take over the House because they are motivated voters. Mm -hmm. So the smaller the turnout, the better it is for the outside outsider candidate. Yeah, I, I would just simply add that, you know, for someone like a Karen Bass, right, you want to make sure that you have that broad, engaged voter d base because you're also talking about her core coalition tends to be lower propensity voters, right? So younger folks, you know, again, communities that are not necessarily going to turn out on these kinds of midterm election days. Right, and progressives. She needs progressives. And if progressives don't think that she's too much of a, she, she's not progressive enough. Right. They don't turn out. Truth be told, if you look at all three of these candidates, they, they kind of ran on the same platform. Uh, too much homelessness in L.A. and crime. What differentiates these mm. candidates? Well, uh, keep in mind, the top two finishers in this race are going to be people that were not aligned with City Hall. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, you told the story, they're friendly. Uh, right. I, well, I mean, th they are friendly. Um, Karen, Karen Bass talks about uh, Rick Caruso. She actually asked him for help. Uh, she told me this and w wasn't in, in uh, confidence, asked him for help in getting the George Floyd bill passed in Washington. Conan, I'm going to interrupt you just a minute because we have Kevin DeLeon who's speaking right now. So we'll go take that live for you and we'll listen to what he has to say. He right now has 7 percent of the votes that are counted so far. Well, I'm going to have a little bit of time here, I think, before we can take that remote. But I can tell you that he's about to speak or has spoken. And when we get it, we'll 
go there. Well, well he, speaking, oh, there we go. Tell you, I want to thank you very much, brother, from the bottom of my heart. You've been there thick and thin. They do it with all their heart. I want to give it up to our team, sirs, joint council. Yeah. Woo. Right. I want to get up for UNAC, the nurses in the house. I want to get up for the longshore men and longshore women in the house. I want to give up, you know, and I don't know if he's here, Kirk Peterson, as well as Ana Briseño, as well as Susan Medal from Unite, Unite Here. For the Unite Here workers, the hotel workers, let's give it up, please. The laborers, the United Farm Workers, as well as SCIU, CIR, let's give it for Chirla Angelica Salas. Let's give it for Chirla. I also want to recognize, you know, a handful of folks that a lot of folks have not met, actually. Especially all of our incredible campaign interns. But they are the architects of the campaign, the folks you often don't see. I want to give to our very own incredible, the leader, la lideressa de la campaña. Let's go for Courtney Pugh. Courtney Pugh, everybody. Courtney's been with me through thick and thin. Since day one, the first time I ever ran for office, and we went, and we went on that improbable journey to run for the U.S. Senate. She was there all the way with me. So that's incredible. Courtney Pugh, everybody. Yeah. I don't think he's here yet, but I want to give up with Daniel Lopez as well. Daniel Lopez. Yeah. The incredible Michelle. Yeah. Michelle. Yeah. Michelle. Yeah. Michelle. Yeah. I want to go for Elena Chavez, Elena Chavez, get to Elena, where's Elena? Where's Elena? Where's Elena? Okay, so we've been listening to uh, Kevin DeLeon, and we were just uh, saying this seems a bit early for him to come out, but there's a chance that he could make news if he endorses somebody. That's right. He could potentially, you know, do an endorsement, and that keeps him in the news. Um, it would also, of course, release uh, some of the folks who have endorsed him, particularly labor unions that have endorsed him. Has he given up his seat on the uh, city council? No. He has not? No. Yeah, a lot of people thought he should have endorsed before now. I mean, uh, it, it, he, he did spend some money, but once you saw Mike Fewer drop out, Joe Biscano drop out, uh, it was probably a foregone conclusion this was a two-person race. Um, especially from uh, okay. Let's listen now. This is uh, Robert Garcia, um, who's running for Congress in the 42nd country, District. That you love what this country has given you and that you always give back more to your country than your country has given to you. And I always tell people all the time, I am so proud to be an American. I'm so proud that at 21 years old I was given the honor to raise my right hand and take an oath to this country, they'll forever be grateful that today I'm as American as every other single person that's here uh, with us tonight. And I'm so grateful to our country for that. I, I'm also, and, and I, my good friends know this, I'm incredibly uh, patriotic. I mean, I, I love uh, what our country stands for, uh, its ideals, and even though we're in difficult times, I think we all can be hopeful that our best days as a country are, are still ahead of us. And when I think about this idea of what patriotism actually is, we have to think about where patriotism is at at this moment. Patriotism is not screaming and yelling America first. Patriotism is not thinking only about yourself and your individual family and what's best for you. Patriotism is not about shutting our doors and our borders to people that need help. Patriotism, real American patriotism, is about loving your country so much that you want to help every single person in your country. That's what real patriotism is about. And I promise, I promise that when we get to Congress, because we're getting to Congress, I promise that I will spend every single day reminding not just the folks on the other side of the aisle, but even folks within our own party, within my own party, to stand up for patriotism, to stand up for loving your country, to take back what it means loving the red, white, and blue flag that's right behind us, and remembering its true ideals and values. 
which is always about doing the most good, helping the most people that we can, thinking about who in our community needs the most help, and putting out a hand and thanking them and welcoming them and helping them. That's what this country has always been about, and that's what this country is going to be in the future. I also think at this moment it's really important that we remember that we have huge issues in front of us. And I am so excited, especially after looking at the results tonight, uh, that we are going to take these issues on uh, after November and into next year. These are issues around making sure that we're always ready for the next pandemic and emergency, ensuring that every single family has a pathway to citizenship and dignity, making sure that we are ensuring that our schools and our communities are safe from gun violence, always standing up for a woman's right to health care and abortion access, making sure making sure that we take That is uh, Robert Garcia. And he certainly has a commanding lead at this point, 49% to 24%. It's not even close in that race, and that certainly sounds like a very happy man. Now, like all elections, turnout is key. Nearly half the population here in L.A. is Latino. So what kind of influence could they have in this election? Joining us right now is Arturo Vargas, the CEO of the National Association of Latino Elected Officials, or NALEO. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. How are you? Uh, we're great. Earlier this week, your organization sent letters to each of the candidates for mayor. What were you asking them? Well, we were asking them to pay attention to the issues that are most important to Latino voters in this election. We took a poll of 1,100 Latino registered voters in the city of Los Angeles, and we asked them, what do you care most about in this election cycle? Number one, the homeless crisis. Number two, inflation and the cost of living. Number three, crime. The, the whole quality of life issues are what is driving Latinos uh, in this election cycle. You know, in 2020, it was COVID. That's falling off the map. Now, Latinos very much care about the economy and what is happening to them on a day-to-day -day basis and being able to make ends meet. And we want the candidates for mayor to pay attention to that. Uh, what endorsements really matter most to the Latino voter, or, or is that a factor at all here? Well, I, uh, research has shown that Latino voters do take a signal from endorsers, uh, not so much from other politicians, but from community leaders, people they respect, people who have been working on behalf of the community. If those individuals stand up for a candidate, then I think Latino voters take notice about that. But, you know, make no... Um, Keep in mind that Latinos really are a sophisticated electorate. They pay attention to the issues, to what's happening in a particular election. They don't just look at the last name. They don't look at the party affiliation. They're looking at what is this candidate saying about the issues that I care about, about my community, about my family. So if you were advising candidates right now, uh, how would you tap into this large voting block? What is the most effective way? How do you reach Latino voters in the community? My advice to a candidate who wants to win an election in the city of Los Angeles is get out there into the streets and hustle. Go out and knock on doors. Engage voters personally. Listen to what's important to them. Don't think that just because you can put up an ad in English and Spanish that you've got the Latino uh, electorate covered or that if you sell a, send a bilingual mailer that you have it done. You have to go out and personally engage Latino voters. That's what consistently they have said they want from candidates. They want to be listened to. They want to be engaged. They do not want to be taken for granted. From time to time, we've been uh, flashing up the congressional district, and they have all been reapportioned. Are you satisfied with the way the reapportionment went? Well, we're actually uh, quite pleased with the way the whole statewide map ended up. I know you're focusing on District 42, the yeah, new yeah. combination. You know, the county of Los Angeles lost a congressional district. That one seat that the state lost came out of L.A. County. And unfortunately, it dismantled a historic Latino district based in East Los Angeles, the currently is represented by the Honorable Lucille Raybaugh Ellard. Uh, and now that district has been combined when that stretches from Southeast Los Angeles down to Long Beach. Uh, we had concerns as to whether or not Latino voters in that district would have an opportunity to really influence the outcome of the election. 
given that the two top vote getters uh, there seem to be both Garcias, both Latinos, mm -hmm. it seems mm -hmm. that um, the next representative there may likely be a Latino or Latina. Arturo Vargas, I'm going to ask you to hold on for just a couple of minutes and we'll come right back to you. We're going to switch live to Beverly uh, White right now. She's with the Karen Bass campaign in Hollywood. Specifically, she's with former mayoral candidate, I believe, Mike Fuhr. Beverly? That's right. Uh, Colleen, we are with the city attorney and the former mayoral candidate who is on board on team Karen Bass, seen over the weekend, in fact, in the double decker tour. Um, campaigning for Miss Bass, who we're told is in the building, but has not joined the party just yet. Tell us, sir, what's on your heart right now as the early numbers are coming in. Well, you know, the early numbers are very good for Karen Bass. Uh, Caruso needed to clean up early on, and he's not doing it. This is He's got one of the worst returns on his massive investment of any candidate I've ever seen. This is going to be Karen's night, and when it's Karen's night, it also portends great things in the November runoff. These two candidates are going to be running off in November. That turnout is going to be great for Karen. It gives her a chance to have a real conversation with an inclusive message for all of Los Angeles. It's going to be very good for Karen and very good for Los Angeles when she wins. I know you love the city, and I know you're on team Karen Bass, so to speak, but this was almost your night. You wanted it to be. What's on your heart right now as a candidate who left the race? Left the race. Yes. How are you feeling right now? Well, you know, obviously, I thought I was the candidate to be the best mayor. I wouldn't have run in the first place. But at the end of the day, I ran out of money. I was ascending in the polls, but I ran out of resources. And at that point, I had to make a decision. Is it a matter of pride for me or what's best for the city? And I had to choose what's best for the city. And that means Karen Bass. And so I'm very proud to be part of that team. Karen and I have had a long relationship. We served together in Sacramento in the teeth of the Great Recession. I saw her leadership skills and her integrity then. I'm looking forward to her leadership here in the city. Thank you so much. City Attorney Mike Field, appreciate you, sir. And that's it for now. We've got many more notables on standby, and we'll share them with you as soon as time permits. Back to you in the studio. Thank you, Colleen. Well, he may have run out of money, but he sure had a cute dog during that campaign. That's for sure. <laughs> wasn't his dog. Wasn't it his wasn't dog. his dog? Oh, okay. I'm disappointed Cute now. Dachshund, but hey, yeah. So here you see the latest numbers in the mayor's race there. And once again, they pretty much haven't changed. This is the percentage of the votes in Rick Caruso with a slight lead there, 41 to 38 percent. Speaking of Rick Caruso, let's go back to Robert Kovacic, who's live at the Rick Caruso team headquarters at the Grove. Robert? Chuck and Colleen, things certainly have changed here. There's plenty of people behind me and two big supporters next to me. Councilmember Joe Buscaino, Councilmember John Lee. Councilman Buscaino, we're gonna start with you. We were talking about this throughout the night and you started this by saying to me, I think these early numbers are going to be a mandate. Are these early numbers an indication of what you wanted? According to Caruso's campaign manager, they have exceeded expectations. Is that true? Absolutely. Look, Rick has never run for a political office. You know, at, at the start of the campaign, he was at 6%. So, of course, he's a top vote getter today. And that shows the people of Los Angeles want change. They want to restore the quality of life. They're tired of, of, of committee reports of task forces. We want to change the direction of LA, of LA, and here we are happening right now. Council Member Lee, what do you think is resonating with voters about Caruso? And on the flip side, what's not here? Well, I think the theme thing that's resonating with Angelinos is resonating me. They're responding to his message about public safety, basics of government, common sense solutions to problems that we are facing here in the city of Los Angeles. Those things, they're simple. And I think people are responding that he's someone that cares about the same issues that they care about. We're, we're on to a runoff. It looks that way. Yeah. What does Rick Caruso need to do after spending $40 million to right. convince voters to come his way in November? Council Member Lee. I think he just needs to keep talking about the same message. The same message is resonating. Not only is there excitement here tonight, there's an excitement throughout the city. When people are talking about Rick, they're excited about voting for him. And that kind of excitement is only going to multiply going into November. The, Rick Caruso uh, tweeting be, right before polls closed that he wants to build a coalition, yes. that L.A. has failed when it comes to inclusivity. Is that going to be the message now in the fall that I can bring everybody to 
together as he as he has done with his business and those coalition buildings are going to be critical in these next several months particularly robert in the hollywood community the hollywood community right now is split and you the, the kevin de leon factor is going to play a critical role here because he's got about eight to, or ten percent of the vote and I truly believe the Kevin De Leon voters are more in line with Rick Caruso, and that's going to get him over the top come November. He will be our next mayor. I'm waiting for our panel to react to that, and you all can jump in right there. Yep. Councilmember Lee, do you believe that De Leon will offer his support to Rick Caruso, and do you think it will play a big difference? I think exactly what Councilman Buscaino says. Regardless of whether he supports Rick, I think his voters are responding to the type of message that Rick's talking about and not the other candidate. So I, I am encouraged. I don't know where, where he's going to go, but I, I think his voters are going to go with Rick. How do you fight the money aspect turning off some people? How do you how do you counter that moving ahead? I don't think anybody faults the guy. They they see him. I think it's a positive. They see him as a successful businessman. They see that you know he understands how to run a business, and that's what they want a little bit more of at City of Los Angeles. So I don't think anybody you know that's going to respond to this message cares about how much money he's spending. They just care about his message. Also, they need to, they will know. They will continue to hear Rick's story. His grandparents, like my grandparents, immigrated here from Italy. He's going to do this with a dollar a year. He's built his own business from scratch. This is more of a money issue. It's more of an experience issue. As John and I know, the mayor of Los Angeles is the chief executive officer of the city of Los Angeles, Robert. And we need a chief executive that will not be afraid to make decisions, that will address the city's crises head on, and that's dealing with homelessness and crime. And he will put a coalition together that will restore our quality of life here in LA. When it comes to building a coalition, he also needs to build a coalition in the horseshoe and get the council behind him. Do you think he's going to have that, or do we just see that this is going to be still very split? I think with his election, is going to be a mandate. And of course, you have to work with the city council. John and I know that very well. Um, but with the mandate comes, you know, cooperation with the city council. And, and I feel that with his election, the council will come on board. John? I think Joe's absolutely right. I think he's speaking to the people of L.A. And so those people are going to be demanding those types of results from the people that represent them in their districts and so I think he's going to have that behind him but I also think Joe I mean Rick's a successful businessman he knows how to deal with people he's willing to listen he's willing to talk and I think that he can build that coalition regardless of what results of the other races are tonight John you said this is a very exciting night is it is it still that way for you it absolutely is I you know what I'm really encouraged by these numbers I think the majority of numbers are coming from areas that we didn't think Rick would be, do so strong in. We're coming to the Valley next, and I know the Valley. Those are my people. They're going to be supporting. Well, you know, the LA Times put out this poll that showed Karen Bass up by 10, 10 points. The LA Times poll was a fake poll. The people have spoken, and he's a top vote getter. Robert, if we go. can take it back here they're for just wait. a minute. Robert, sure, if guys, we can take it back here for the next for... batch of votes, and then Caruso's going to come out. There's a lot of noise down there, so it's it's kind of hard. Obviously, those two gentlemen are Rick Caruso supporters. I want to ask it, both uh, Cohen and Dr. Anjumarie, does anybody see um, throwing the support behind Kevin DeLeon, behind Rick Caruso? I mean, I, I, I mean from what I know, I, I don't see that's a possibility. Whether his voters decide to go that way is one thing, but... I can't see that. Happening. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, certainly when you think about who is supporting Kevin DeLeon um, in terms of the names that he called just when we had him speaking a few minutes right. ago, mm -hmm. yeah. I think there is very little, if any, chance that any of those folks are going to be heavily Caruso. That said, of course, again, there are going to be folks who are going to look around um, who are dissatisfied, particularly those Latinos who might be in the Valley, to Con Councilman Lee's point just a minute ago. There may be some folks who are going to look around and maybe not follow his endorsement. Yeah, no, uh, the, it, it, it's, it's a lot can happen between now and November. He's not going to endorse Rick Russo, that's for sure. But uh, the, you know, we have to remember 
One thing we learned in the 2020 presidential election is that Donald Trump's support from Hispanic voters went up. Mm -hmm. And the, the notion that the Democratic Party is going to have a permanent majority because of the surge, of that turned out not to be true. Because there are a lot of Hispanic voters who are socially conservative. They're also individuals who, during the pandemic, needed to work, didn't like the shutdowns. One of the reasons why Nevada uh, voted, uh, you had a big, uh, a much more Republican vote out of Nevada was because of their reaction to the pandemic uh, shutdown. So um, it, it, it is not a, it's a huge voting block, and that means it is splitting. You talk about spending a lot of money, and, and Rick Caruso may be perceived as being the incumbent, so to speak, on this. But the, the term that I've heard in the past couple of weeks, uh, either from his supporters or the candidate himself, is fresh approach. So is that something that resonates with voters now, as opposed to um, Congresswoman Bass, who has been in Washington for some time? Six terms, I believe. Uh, well, uh, I, I'd say uh, con uh, uh, Karen Bass has the advantage of not being out of City Hall. Set as does Rick Crusoe. Right. Uh, Twenty percent of the city council, the LA City Council, is either in federal lockup or they're possibly headed to federal prison. Uh, Kevin De Leon took the place of Jose Wizar, who is in a federal prison. Mm -hmm. Mike Fewer's office was raided by the FBI. We just had a DWP official sentenced in federal court. So people look at City Hall mm -hmm. and they don't want somebody in City Hall, and that's either Rick Caruso or Karen Bass. All right, most Californians voted today in a new electoral district following the uh, 2020 census. A group of 14 California citizens took on the immense task of redrawing the California districts. Joining us right now is Linda Ukatagawa. I hope I got that right, Linda. A commissioner from We Draw the Lines. Uh, was I close? <laughs> uh, close, yes, it's Akutagawa. So oh, just that first Oh, thank you so much. We want to get it right. <laughs> Well, what was the experience like? I mean, we talk about it being uh, a an immense process here. Describe it for us. I will tell you that when I first started, I was literally drinking from that fire hose. I really felt that way, just learning a lot about the whole process. And that was the whole purpose of the of this Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission, get 14 people who have absolutely no ties to the political machinery in the state of California. Um, but that meant that we had a really, you know, fast and steep learning curve, which I believe we all did. And at the end of it all, I have to say, I'm just super proud of what we were able to accomplish. We had um, a unanimous vote for the maps that we ultimately um, created. Uh, we had no challenges, no legal challenges to the maps that we were ultimately uh, tasked to do, uh, to create, and we're just super proud. And it was a, it was definitely a, a once in a lifetime experience, and I'm, I'm Linda? happy to get it. Linda, how big was the puzzle that you had? I mean, I, I see it oh as a puzzle gosh. laid out on the desk with a lot of pieces. How many pieces yes. were you moving around? Let's put it this way, we had 80 assembly districts, uh, we had 40 Senate districts and 52 congressional districts and four Board of Equalization districts. So it's a, a lot of puzzle pieces that we're, we were working with. The assembly was especially large when you think about 80. Um, and and, and, I, and this is the way, if, if anybody's ever interested, you know, and you really want to get nerdy on this, you could go and watch our, our videos of our meetings. They're all public. Um, you move one piece, and then it has this entire ripple effect throughout the state. Linda, uh, we understand there were five Democrats, five Republicans, and four independents here. You guys yes. all came together unanimously. So do you yes. have any advice for Washington? <laughs> you, you know, I, it, it's possible. I think if you get, um, you know, practical... Um, just, uh, you know, just people who really are looking to, to look, to do the best and, and what's in the best interest for, for the people. That's really what I think the 14 of us had in mind when we came together, we all had a mission, a goal in mind, which is, you know, to do the best that we can for the people of California. Hey, Linda, so here we've got the election tonight and here we've got all these congressional districts. What is it that you want to see tonight? Well, you know, 
I'm actually really excited because this is the first time that the new maps that we drew are in effect. And it's really, to me, as, as a watcher now of all these electoral races, I, I'm really, you know, just excited to see some of the more closer races or the ones that were considered toss-ups. I think it's really... For me, I want I wanted people, you know, the people of California, I wanted them to have a choice, an actual competitive choice. Are there any overriding considerations well, when you lay out this puzzle and try to figure out how to put the pieces back together? Well, we have six criteria that we're beholden to follow, you know, from the California Constitution. The first and most basic one is that every district has to be of equal size. Um, with the state Senate, the state assembly and the board of equalization, we have a little bit of wiggle room. We have a, a standard deviation that we were able to work within about plus or minus five, uh, five percent. But with the congressional districts, there was no wiggle room. It was either zero plus one or minus one. And uh, there's 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 a lot of work that went into it to to maintain that. But you, you came up with a lot of very if we just look at it on a map, very odd shaped districts. I mean, we've been talking about uh, District 42, but I'm sure there were some other ones up and down the state of California as well. Sure. Where people so, have to travel again, a long way. Great distance. Yes. And and it is true. Um, so the other two criteria or other uh, four yeah, six criteria total equal population. Number two was Voting Rights Act. So that was a really huge criteria. Uh, number three is contiguity. So obviously they all have to connect together. And number four, and this is this is important, and I think this will help explain some of the otter shapes, communities of interest. So between uh, equal population and uh, the Voting Rights Act and ensuring that um, uh, communities will be able to elect the, the candidate of their choice and then also the communities of interest. We took in over 36,000 pieces of community input from, you know, the people of California. And what that meant is we were trying to put these puzzle pieces of communities together that felt that they had common interests. Um, and, and it wasn't just by, you know, um, you know, like race or culture. That was the last thing that we were really, you know, not even able to really take into account. But things like, um, you know, economics, um, you know, in Orange County where I live, we got a lot of feedback about, you know, a coastal community and wanting to be together as a coastal community. So you get a really long district because it's along the coast. Along the eastern edge, we heard loud and clear from a lot of people along the eastern Sierras who said, we do not want to be with Los Angeles. So we went <laughs> further north. And so you saw some longer shapes. Um, we also got a lot of feedback in terms of communities that felt um, that they really wanted to be with other similar communities facing, you know, for example, agricultural kind of challenges or environmental justice kind of challenges. There was lots of different kinds of reasons why people consider themselves communities of interest and wanted to be with other similar types of communities. And those were all part of the puzzle pieces that we were looking to meet. Um, we try to do the best we can. There was as with anything, you know, we couldn't satisfy everybody. There was a lot of competing um, uh, testimonies. We try to keep in mind, again, what is going to be the best that we can create that is for the greatest good uh, for the state of California. And it sounds like you were very successful. Linda Akutagawa? Yes. All right, thank there you. There you go. Thank right. you. We appreciate your time and all the work you put into this. She's talking about unusual districts. I guess the people of Catalina didn't mind being associated with Long Beach and the rest mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. But that, that's an odd one, too. Well, listen, there, the, there, that's nothing compared to some of the districts before. There were districts in California that were connected by the high tide line uh, <laughs> along the beach back when, re, when gerrymandering were taken. So, yeah, that's... That's a, it's a model for the country, wouldn't you say? I mean, I would say absolutely it's been a model for the country. And ha one of those nerds who actually attended some of those community feedback uh, yeah. sessions and is getting right out here with us exactly. right now. Exactly. Um, yes, I've even got my glasses to prove it. Um, 
But, you know, they were, they really, the people on the commission really wanted to hear from community. And they were there whether there were five people on the Zoom call or whether there were 500 people on the Zoom call willing to listen and to take in the feedback. And so I was really impressed with that piece of it as well, that they weren't just kind of in a room making these decisions, you know, or with a computer doing something. They actually listened to the people. Uh, right. When she said that they didn't get one legal challenge, compare that to New York State and Florida, <laughs> where they actually had to go to the highest court, and, the, and that goes back to the governor's office and the legislature. It's a mess at some of those places. And I'll tell you, Arnold Schwarzenegger takes great pride because that, that reform was passed uh, under his administration. And, and again, uh, yeah, it's worked so far. We're going to move along here. Democrats in California control the state legislature. Governor Newsom, also a Democrat. So the question is, how do Republicans gain more ground here? Joining us right now is Jessica uh, Patterson, chairwoman of the California Republican Party. Heading into uh, the results this evening, how strong do you think the Republican Party is in California right now? Well, I think California is certainly at a turning point. I think we have a lot of opportunities. As you guys know, in 2020, we were responsible for sending more new Republicans to the House of Representatives than any other state in the nation. We played in four seats. We won those four seats. Following the redistricting commission's new draws of the lines, we'll be protecting those four congressional seats, but we'll also have the opportunity to pick up five additional seats. So we're watching those seats very closely to see our candidates that come through the primary, um, and that will give us the best foot forward to, to November and taking back the House. Jessica, for those of us here in Southern California, what would you consider a victory tonight? Well, certainly we're going to be watching a lot of different races. I think one of the most interesting races uh, has already been called, and that was the recall of the San Francisco DA. I think that when you have the people of San Francisco a, a liberal bastion of, of radical ideas, I'm saying enough's enough that these soft on crime policies aren't working for us. I think that is a big statement to be made. And I think here in, in Southern California, where we're watching uh, Los Angeles County collect signatures to recall their disaster of a district attorney, this is gonna be one of those things that gives them a shot in the arm. Hey, Dukona, jump in here and give us a little background of what happened while we have Jessica with us. Right. Well, uh, the uh, party chair, hello, Jessica, uh, reference to uh, uh, Chessie Aboudin, the uh, district attorney of San Francisco, one of the leading progressive DAs in the country. Uh, he faced a recall largely from uh, Asian and Latino voters in that city because he has a, uh, they were upset at the surge in crime, the surge in break in. The, uh, the homelessness problem, he also wouldn't, hadn't, hadn't prosecuted any drug crimes, not even fentanyl crimes. And so, uh, to your point, that is the big story that Washington's paying attention to. Because what it says, the New York Times is making this point, is that the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco, their city council, mm -hmm. overwhelming, there's not one Republican on it. They were overwhelmingly in favor of this DA. So was the state Democratic Party. And yet, they were hammered by the voters tonight. Over 60% voted to recall this district attorney, this progressive. So George Gascon, this, this, is, this is not happy. He's not a happy guy right now. He sees what happened to the guy who took his place uh, in, as DA of San Francisco. And you're right, that is, that is sending a shockwave through the Democratic Party. And the, the Democrats have, have worried about, in you know, Washington, about being on the wrong side of the crime issue. And, and this is a very sobering vote out of San Francisco. I agree 100% that this is a very sobering vote. And I think the other really important thing to think about here is what impact it's going to have down here in the mayoral race. And so, you know, thinking about that, um, would love to hear, you know, your thoughts on whether or not um, Rick Caruso, as someone who's a former Republican but who has now registered as a Democrat, you know, how does he attract uh, those Republican voters or keep them in his fold, if I can put it that way, um, is if, you know, he continues as we expect him to in the November uh, runoff. Well, I think what's been very clear is that establishment Democrats have done no Californians and certainly Los Angeles City is a, an epicenter of that, um, where we've seen these radical and regressive policies that have made this surge in crime possible, a homeless crisis that takes up for, you know, more than half of the, the nation's homeless population here in California. And then the price of everything, the cost of everything has just gone absolutely sky high. And the establishment Democrats have let this happen. It has all happened on their watch under one party rule. 
Can, can I ask one quick question on a different issue? Uh, uh, Congressional District 22 in the, in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, David Valadeo, one of the 10 Republicans to vote to impeach Donald Trump. Um, he's facing a tough campaign from a Democrat and from a Republican. Does your party endorse uh, the reelection of, of a man that Donald Trump wants to see defeated? We endorsed him early on in this race. Okay, so that's a succinct response. <laughs> <laughs> okay, touche. Um, well, you know, I have a quick question here. How do you, how do you get uh, Democrats who will not vote for Republican candidates to look at issues as opposed to party lines? Yeah, we definitely did that in 2020. We played in 11 of the 12 initiatives that were on the ballot. California voters were with the California Party. California Republican Party seven out of the 11 times. They were not with the California Democrat Party's position 66% of the time. So the first step is getting there on the ideas. And I'm sure, Colleen, you have filled up your tank of gas. Today, we reached another record high. $6.37 is our average here in California. We're paying $1.45 more than the national average. And in parts of Los Angeles, it's much higher than that. When California voters are paying seven, possibly eight dollars a gallon for gas come November, they're going to want some change. This governor was unable to even get his Democrat legislature supermajority not to give a gas tax holiday. That was clearly asking too much of California Democrats. But to stop the increase that is coming up on July 1st, they couldn't even get it together to stop the increase of the gas tax. California voters are going to remember that, and they're going to want some change. Jessica, we want to thank you for joining us tonight. We certainly appreciate it. Well, you know, we've been waiting for the vote count, and it's been very, very slow tonight. Lolita Lopez can probably answer some questions about why that is happening. She's down in Downey, where they're actually counting the votes. Lolita. Yeah, that's right, Chuck. And, you know, it just takes some time to get all across those ballots from all across the county here to this location. We're in the Tally Operations Center here in Downey. And these are some of my new friends that are waiting right there to get ready to count the ballots that are coming again from all across the county. We're talking even Catalina Island. They bring those by sheriff's helicopter to this location. We know that about close to a million at least were processed as of 630 this afternoon, which accounts for about 17 percent of registered voters in L.A county actually casting their ballot but those need to be counted here they're going to count those that were processed today that means those people that went in to vote today and then the rest of the vote by mail ballots as well as other ones that may be coming through remember if a, a vote by mail ballot has been postmarked by today it just hasn't arrived here they're going to count those as well and take a look at this you can actually be watching this from home if you want the chance to do this across youtube la county has three cameras that are up right now you have the incoming ballots that's in a room that's just a little bit to our right behind this room that we're in is the ballot preparation that's when the boxes of ballots come in they look to them they prepare them make sure that they're ready to go that the signatures and everything's match and then of course they come to the tally operation center which is where we are so it looks like this is going to get started in about 20 to 30 minutes and then it's going to get really busy after that Guys, back to you. A lot of standing around right now, though, Lita. Yeah, I don't think I've ever Lita. seen it that empty <laughs> yeah. uh, this late in the game. I mean, we're hour and 40 minutes what? since the polls closed. Yeah. To be honest with you, though, back in 2020, it was sort of similar in the fact that, like, there was a lot of sort of waiting around for this process getting ready. But then once they started coming in, it was literally like a machine going. And then it goes on throughout the night. And remember, the final counts, this is a, about a seven-day counting period. So we will get some results tomorrow. But these results are going to be trickling in over a seven-day process that is allowed here in the county of Los Angeles. So it's going to take some time and some patience, especially if some of these races are close. So they're coming in by vehicles, obviously, correct, or except in the case of Catalina where they're using a helicopter. So are they getting escorted by the police, sheriff's department? by the deputies, by sheriff's deputies, okay. yes indeed. And there's actually sheriff deputies in here. And actually, even to get to this place from the parking lot, we have to be escorted here. Every single person coming through here, it's very rigid, lots of transparency too with the cameras that we showed you and with the operations going on here, making sure that everything is secure. Just take some time. It's a big county, Chuck. You know there's traffic out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, got yeah, it. Yeah, there is traffic out there. <laughs> truer words, Lolita, truer words. All right, thank you. Sure. We'll get back to you in just a few minutes. I'm wondering if we put up the latest numbers on uh, 
the mayor's race here, the slate. Uh, this looks like 39% uh, of the votes have been counted so far, and they seem to be holding strong, 41% for Rick Caruso, Karen Bass, 38 Kevin DeLeon, 7%. Did I miss it, or did Kevin DeLeon concede? I mean, do you concede if you're number three? What? Yeah, I think he did. That's he, uh, just by coming nice. out. He said sort of good night, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. by coming out when he did. That was sort of de facto concession. So, so, I mean, that's a healthy number so far, if you think about it. Almost 40%. Uh, yeah, that's a strong number of folks, you know, who have already been counted. And uh, I was doing the numbers while we were we were um, listening to Robert Kavasik a few a few minutes ago, and uh, judging by how much Rick Caruso spent and how many votes he's gotten right now, that works out to about a quarter million dollars per vote right now in terms of what he spent um, and the return on the investment. So we'll see more votes come in, but right now we're looking at. $33 million, 99,000 votes. That's about a quarter of a million per vote. Does Karen Bass have a war chest that she can go to after this, a big one? She will get some. Um, she has some, but of course there's also some matching funds that will also come in as well. Um, so it's not as huge of a war chest, of course, as Rick Caruso's, but it will be substantial. She'll get a lot more money. I mean, w once it pairs down to the November election, I think a lot of people expected her to make the runoff just because of the high profile she has. She has a history. And, uh, and the Caruso campaign will make the argument that, uh, you know, he's at 6 percent at three months. Uh, 41 percent coming in first would be, you know, terrific for him. Certainly it's a setting it, off point. I really wouldn't expect either of those, Karen Bass or Rick Caruso, to come out during the time that we're on the air here. But come 11 o'clock, that's when you really want to get out because you've got all the broadcast stations on the air. So... Absolutely. I think right. They both claim so. victory. Yeah. You know, whether they're I mean, I mean if it's this close, or not. you could. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. They made the runoff and uh, and they'll just say whatever it is, whatever the number is, it's on to November. We're going to nail it down then. I'm going to you know, I'm, who knows? Uh, Karen Bass may at the podium tonight ask Kevin DeLeon to join her campaign. Um, that's always possible. Or so you could know, drive over there. I was going to say, that might be one of the that reasons he was be, so early. You know, yeah. <laughs> That's a good well, idea. Well, you know, it's interesting because when I talked to Robert, uh, he was interviewing Joe Buscaino at 7 o'clock. Uh, Joe said something like, we, and I wanted to ask Robert a follow-up question, <laughs> didn't get a chance to, but uh, we, does that mean he has a position <laughs> if and when Rick Caruso does move to well, City Well, it needs a job, doesn't he? I mean, he's out of the city council because he decided not to run for re-election and run for mayor instead. I don't know. I would assume that, yes, if Rick Caruso becomes mayor, there will be some somewhere in his administration for the city councilman who stood by his side. And campaigned in and the last few weeks. For him. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Carolyn Johnson has been following these congressional races for us tonight. We'll go live to her. She's right outside. Carolyn. Yeah, Chuck, uh, you know, we've been tracking some of the more competitive ones in our area. We talked a bit about this a bit before. A recent redistricting has really changed things up. Every 10 years, the census data is used to redraw districts based on population change. California has lost a congressional seat this time, and that's led to some new boundaries for our local districts. Um, let's take a look at the 27th congressional district right now. You'll recall Mike Garcia won this seat in 2020 by just 333 votes. Former Assembly Member Christy Smith is running again. It's a slightly different uh, district now. The redistricting actually has made this one slightly more in favor of the Democrats. But let's take a look at the leaderboard right now because uh, we are seeing, oh, this is actually the race for Orange County. So we'll talk about this one a little. Uh, Katie Porter is the incumbent in this seat. And this is another one of these races where the boundaries were redrawn somewhat significantly. Uh, Katie Porter leading here with 58% of the vote. Uh, Scott Baugh, the Republican, has 27 percent, looking like, of course, those two will face off in November, keeping in mind that Katie Porter used to have uh, majority Irvine in her um, region. This time around, she has a lot of the coastal communities, including Huntington Beach and Newport Beach. And now we're talking about uh, the Mike Garcia, Christy Smith race. As I mentioned, Christy Smith lost in 2020 by just 333 votes. Mike Garcia, the Republican incumbent, with 43% of the vote. But you can see how tight this one is. Christy Smith at 41%. 
uh, Quay Corte was hoping to really be in this race, uh, but as you can see, he is a distant third right now, and we have 36 percent of the votes reporting here. So likely we're looking at Mike Garcia, Christy Smith facing off in November, and uh, it's, it's exciting times out here. Lots of different things changing. We're going to have, of course, much more on this for you coming up a bit later. Chuck and Colleen, send it back to you. All right, Carolyn, thank you. Um, any questions for Carolyn? Well, uh, so uh, the 27th, um, they took Simi Valley out of his That's district. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and that is a, that is a Repu suburban Republican stronghold. He has been uh, living on the edge for some time. I think this will be the fourth time Christy Smith takes on Mike Garcia, assuming she's uh, able to, uh, uh, for, you know, take, stay in the position she, she's in and make it to the, to the November election. Uh, th this guy is, uh, has barely hung on, but he has barely hung on. He is he yet, the Democrats, it takes. And, uh, and he's still, um, even without Simi Valley, uh, he's still a, a very strong contender to keep that race, if it, particularly if it's a Republican year. You well, know, we talk about these races being competitive when they redistrict and redrew the boundary lines here. That's a perfect example right there when they're that close in terms of the voting at this point. Yeah, I was just going to say, having lived in this district 10 years ago, um, they have a tendency to keep those Democratic candidates for multiple cycles to see if they can push over, right? So this has been a district that's been trending purple for a really long time. Um, and before Christy Smith, there was a, before Katie Porter um, mm -hmm. and Christy Smith, there was a guy again who was, again, they kept putting him on the ballot. The party kept putting him on the ballot and hoping that it would turn, it would turn, it would turn. And so... It's not clear whether or not the Democratic Party should stick with Christy Smith after this time if, again, it doesn't happen, right? The, because the margins times. are so narrow there that any of the candidates that don't make it, like Quay that we see on the screen here, even a 6% you could do a lot. Absolutely. Yeah, it could help her out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I mention Katie Porter, though, in, in, the, uh, in Orange County? Uh, that... Uh, Carolyn was right. That's much of that is new to her. It's still a Democratic district. I think it voted for Biden by one or two points. I'm not sure about that now, but uh, it, it, it's so there's much of that district that's new to her. That 58 percent says a lot about her, um, about how much we see of her on YouTube, because Katie Porter, unlike any other member of Congress in memory, perhaps in the history of the institution, has had more YouTube moments hmm. as a low-ranking member, of, of a committee member, putting the, the fire to some CEOs. The head of Wells Fargo resigned shortly after her in, uh, interrogation of him. And it's in a way that people can understand. Right. Even Republicans can understand because nobody, there's not a lot of, um, you know, passion for some of the CEOs on the other side of those questions. So um, I, I'm a, it, she has made a name for herself. MSNBC talks about her a lot. So does CNN. Beca and, and I think that resonates with people have seen that. I think people definitely see it. I think the other thing that she captures that, again, has been really hard for Democrats to capture is the kind of disgust that people have with the status quo, right? So she is able to make an argument with these YouTube moments for Democrats being just as outraged no matter who's in the White House, right? Um, and so I think that's what draws Democrats to her. And then she captures that anger that Republicans have as well in a way that's very, very populist, um, for lack of yeah, a better way absolutely. of saying it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And I, and I think that has made its way to a lot of voters who didn't, who, who, who were not her constituents up That's until right. now. Yeah, there's a certain admiration for I, her I think, I and think the way so. she takes it yeah. on. It's astonishing. Mm -hmm. it's, it, you got to see it. it it's, it's, it I, I've never seen anything like it, frankly. That, and for a female candidate, I mean, she does a really good job of not kind of tilting over into kind of hectoring or lecturing, you know, and again, not that... Women candidates can't lecture, but the idea is voters generally punish candidates who are seen as, you know, kind of a little too kind of motherlike, for lack of a better way of saying it. We have another candidate now who's before the microphone. That's uh, Robert Luna, who, of course, is running for Los Angeles County Sheriff. So I think we can take that live and see what he Listen is up. saying. Yeah, we're going to get it here in just a minute. There he is. 
Oh, we're interviewing. No, we got you. Hello. Okay, I thought you were maybe <laughs> yes. addressing a group of people, but this is this is great. So uh, we're taking a look at a very small percentage of the votes that are in right now. We've got uh, the current sheriff at 31. You were second there, running at 27 percent. How do you feel about what's going on tonight at this early point? Uh, and, and you just hit the nail on it. It's early. And uh, I feel good about the early results. I'm very cautiously optimistic, but we have a long ways to go. And so, Chief Luna, if I could ask, you know, I know if these results were to hold, um, you know, one of the things that many of the candidates who were running in the sheriff's race this past season have really done is to say, you know, we need to get rid of Alex Villanueva. We need to get rid of Alex Villanueva. They haven't always said as much about what they're for, right, as opposed to being anti Villanueva. And so if you continue, what are going to be some of the things that you are going to bring to the table that say, not only am I not Villanueva, this is who Chief Luna is? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, the first thing is uh, you get somebody who's a collaborator. Uh, you get somebody who will be working with the Board of Supervisors, somebody who will be working with oversight, uh, somebody who is a partner uh, to everybody inside law enforcement, outside law enforcement, with a special emphasis on the community. Uh, I'm a full believer that policing is not effective. Uh, if you don't have the full cooperation and consent of the community. Uh, that's just to start off. You know, uh, we, we know that you are police chief in Long Beach. Uh, Jim McDonald, sort of the same thing before he ran for sheriff. Uh, have you talked to him? Any advice about, uh, about this run against Villanueva? Uh, yes. Uh, I have not only talked to uh, Jim McDonald, uh, but I've talked to many people inside and outside of law enforcement. I'm very fortunate. I was uh, on the executive board for the Major City Chiefs Association. I was the Western Region representative. And because of my contacts across the country, uh, both with police chiefs, sheriffs, uh, I can pick up the phone and call just about anybody across the country. People know me. And that's the relationships that I'm gonna to bring to the sheriff's department. I tell people, I wanna make the sheriff's department into a 21st century department. One that's uh, uh, open to change, one that wants to evolve, that's forward thinking. And that's how people know me and recognize me. Uh, Chief, one of the charges that the, the sheriff has made is that it's this is all a matter of the Board of Supervisors just want to get him out of there at all costs, so they'll try to get as many candidates as they possibly could to run against him. How do you respond to that? You know, uh, again, it's very critical to have a relationship with the people uh, that you work with in government, the people who uh, control your budget. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I just think that it is ridiculous. Uh, as your sheriff, I will not be behaving that way. Now, when you're governing and making policy with people, you're going to have disagreements. But the goal is you're going to problem solve, find compromise, and you. I will not be calling them names, uh, degrading them or threatening them, uh, as we've seen the last several years. So you're just going to see a completely different temperament uh, with me as a sheriff. Uh, uh, Chief, let me ask you, the, the Conan Nolan here, uh, does, does the county need a new jail? I believe it does. Okay. I believe it that's does. A, that's, all we, that's all we need. I appreciate that. Just on the record. <laughs> all right, Chief Robert Luna, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, again, the latest numbers here. 32% of the votes counted. Uh, it's a very close race. Alex Villanueva, 31%. Robert Luna, 27 Let's switch live right now to... Uh, Thank Alex Villanueva's headquarters, thank he's at the everyone mic. everyone who is here tonight. This is an important historical day. And it started off with a bang. The DA of San Francisco has just conceded he has been recalled. <laughs> George Gascon, you're next. The numbers are early. It's kind of hard to figure out where it's going, but I do know that we're sitting on top. We anticipate remaining on top. But I do know this. 
you don't get to be sheriff of LA County in supporting a failed district attorney like George Gascon. Did I just describe eight other candidates for sheriff? So let's see what happens. I think we're, in, we're on the right track, but it's important to rec recognize, as Mike said, what we've done to get here. One first and foremost, I got to thank my lovely wife Vivian right here. <laughs> yesterday we celebrated our, yesterday was our silver anniversary. Yeah. Without her support, the support of her family, I would not be here today. We would definitely, it'd be a different chapter in our history, but we're on the right track. We're focusing on what matters to people, homelessness and violent crime. Yes. I've been playing eight on one basketball for since the campaign started, literally eight on one. And if you throw in all the other opportunists, it's been a lot more than that on one. And yet we're still on top. Why is that? People, people understand. They understand the difference between political establishment people that really, really want to be work for the Board of Supervisors and the people who care about independently elected sheriff. So we're going to keep pushing forward and we can end this all tonight. We'll find out soon enough. And you know what? Even if it goes, if it goes a long way, I'm built for endurance. And uh, when I was an unknown, when I was an unknown with the support of everyone here, the support of the community, we did the unthinkable. We want to break away for just a moment. We will rejoin the sheriff in a second, but we want to let everyone know that we are going to be leaving our audience that is watching us live right now on Peacock. We're also going to continue to scream on NBCLA.com, Roku, Fire TV, and Apple TV. Mayoral candidates Karen Bass and Rick Caruso expected to speak soon. We will take them live. And if that means I have to battle the Board of Supervisors. Okay, and for so the rest of us, we will rejoin the uh, sheriff here in what's sounding like a victory speech. Because the Board of Supervisors doesn't answer 911 call. They're not rolling code three with their hair on fire to save somebody's life. They're not talking to victims or the relatives of the deceased who were killed, trying to comfort them and trying to solve a tragedy and bring those to justice. They're not anywhere to be found in any of that. You can only find the Board of Supervisors when they're trying to figure out how to cut my budget further. So for those people in the establishment that somehow think I have to have an important relation with the board, yeah, one only. Make my budget work. Play, that's it. The details are between me and you, the people. And we're going to keep doing that. So uh, I kind of funny because I'm reading all these reports. Oh my God, he doesn't get along with the board. Right. That's the whole idea. There's a bunch of candidates that got along real well with the board because they were recruited by the Board of Supervisors. Every single one of them. In fact, they were competing with, with a platform that they know was not going to win them because they didn't care. The whole idea is to try to drag us under 50. It's not going to work. It won't work today. It's not going to work in November because the people are getting wise to the political establishment. When the truth and the good Lord is on your side, we will win. So with that, I want to thank everyone. We're going to be here for a while, and we'll see how these, as these numbers keep getting updated. And uh, it's a beautiful day. You got it. And, in, and a big shout out to Gil Carrillo, El Cucuy, right there. The man has been an inspiration, dedicated his life. And can you believe someone from one of these fake media outlets dared to call him a gang member? Yes. 
Shame on them. We work with reality, with facts, with evidence, and we take all of that to hold people accountable when they need to be held accountable, but we also pe give people a hand up, give them a second chance. Those that can be reformed, we try to reform them. We're not here to throw people away. I'm not into that disposable society. I don't into the cancel culture or anything like that. It's hashtag victims matter, first, second, third, and always. So with that, let's uh, enjoy everyone's company. Thank you all for being here. Let's see how the night ends, but I promise you this, whichever way it ends, either to- All right, we've been listening to Sheriff Alex Villanueva. We understand mayoral candidate Karen Bass is just on stage. Let's listen in. <laughs> Yvette, my daughter, Michael, my son-in-law, and Henry, my grandson, you have been at my side every step of the way on this journey that we began eight months ago. I love you and thank you. How are we doing, L.A.? Now, we don't have the final numbers yet, but let me tell you, I have a feeling that we're going to do very well tonight. I am humbled and honored and blessed to know that you have my back and I have yours, L.A. Tonight, we're seeing the voters make a clear choice. They want leadership who is battle-tested, mission-driven, and who always fights for L.A.'s values. Tonight, the city will see that it's hard to defeat a people-powered campaign. It's hard to defeat passionate door knockers, no matter how much money is spent. And it's hard to defeat folks who are committed to a cause, not just a candidate. stood strong against an onslaught, a $45 million onslaught to be exact, spent by a billionaire. It's all of the community organizations that fueled this campaign, that walked precincts, made thousands of calls that are at the heart of this campaign and will carry us over the finish line. a campaign about the strength and power that must be marshaled against the so many crises that we face. Strength and power can only come from the power of the people. Everyone here tonight from every part of the city and every stripe of the rainbow that is Los Angeles, this is our strength. You are our strength. And together we will make a city a place where you can afford to live, where you want to live, because you feel safe, because the air you breathe is clean, and because people are no longer dying on our streets. Not but not, but not with empty promises from the past, but through a bold path forward. So look, Angelinos know the difference between a soundbite and a solution, and so do I. From treating uninsured patients in county ER to organizing neighbors to fight crime. But you know what? Because I chose to spend my life fighting for justice, I'm used to attacks, especially from those who want to maintain the status quo, who do not want to seriously do what it takes to to solve the problems we face. And by the way, some of that $45 million was spent on attacks. But you know what, though? I faced attacks before, and I have stood strong, fought back, and won, and that's exactly what we've done tonight. Los Angeles change is coming, and our campaign is leading the way. We're leading the way so we can have a city where one job is enough to make ends meet. Yeah. We're leading the way to a city that runs on clean, green energy, leading the way to a city where young people see a future for themselves and their children, and every single one of you gathered here tonight is an angel in the city of angels. We call home working hard for change and for our future. Now, let me thank all of the people who were here and helped lead the march to victory tonight. First to my family. This is my family and my partner. The Bass family. <laughs> and we look like Los Angeles. <laughs> oh 
to my sisters and brothers in labor, thank you. Our march together continues because we believe at our very core that hard work deserves dignity. Now, as your mayor, I won't be alone because I have other people's champions to help move us forward. All of the current and former elected officials, thank you so much for your support. Thanks to all of you for joining our fight for every parent forced to work two or three jobs to cover rent and who's frightened to death about what will happen if their car breaks down. Thank you for joining our fight for small business owners already reeling from a pandemic who now worry about smash and grabs plunging them deeper into debt. Thank you for joining our fight to house over 50,000 Angelinos who will go to sleep on our streets tonight. So the bottom line is we need leadership to bring us together. And here's what change means. When we are in City Hall, we will stop the crimes of today by responding to neighborhood calls for more officers on the beat. And we will also prevent the crimes of tomorrow by investing in proven prevention and reduction strategies. Stop the crimes of today and prevent the crimes Okay, we're going to break away from this because now we have Rick Caruso at the mic. About 40% of the votes are in. He has a slight three-point lead. We are not helpless in the face of our problems. We will not allow this city to decline. We will no longer accept excuses. We have the power to change direction of Los Angeles, and that's the way we're voting. I frequently hear and read how divided people are. But what I found out is that people share so much in common. They're upset about the problems of homelessness. They're upset about the problems of crime, corruption. But they're also upset that our city government seems to accept these problems as if life has to be this way. What voters are saying tonight is no, it doesn't. It does not have to be this way. Now, when I started that, the go for it. I want to remind people that a couple of months ago, only a couple of months ago, only 6% of the people knew who I was. How are we doing tonight? And it's not because I'm some political genius. It's because we've been proposing practical solutions for very complex problems that people understand. We've been listening to people around the city. This is an important moment in the history of our city. Angelinos feel unheard. They feel left out. They feel worried and hopeless. But as I have traveled around and as I have listened, I am hopeful, I am confident that we can change and change will happen. Ah, yes we will, sweet Alice. I feel hopeful listening to sweet Alice and Omar and everybody I've talked to, children, parents, business people, entrepreneurs, artists, there's a love for this city that's deep in their hearts. Angelinos are good people, hardworking people, proud and committed to work together to get this city back on track. Loving people who want to be heard, tired of excuses from career politicians, but they're still eager to help. I believe in the good of our city, the strength, the courage, the hope, the hope to dream and celebrate our greatest strength, our diversity. This is what I love about this city. It's our people. It's our diversity. It's the fact that we have 224 languages spoken in the city of Los Angeles. That's something to celebrate. More than anything else, it's the big thing we have in common. The shared belief that anything is possible. Anything. And I believe that. So this is a great awakening. Our big, beautiful city needs our help. We are the greatest city in the most incredible nation on earth, but we can't proclaim that our city is the greatest if we don't offer our homeless a better path forward, if we allow people to live in their own waste and die in the streets, if we tolerate corrupt officials, if we allow crime to suffocate our communities and spiral out of control, and if we don't allow second chances for those who deserve it. This city is a family, and at times, we raise our voices, like all good families, when there's different perspectives. But as with all good families, we want to be united in purpose and united in hope. 
We want to strip away our differences and proclaim out loud what unites us, not what divides us. As I have spent the last few months campaigning, meeting Angelinos from every walk of life, every ethnicity, every lifestyle, every corner of this wonderful city, I have again realized what I've always believed but have sometimes forgotten. Angelinos just want their fair share of the American dream. Whether they arrive from some foreign land or they've been here for generations, they want to work hard, they want to provide for their families, they want to sacrifice for future generations. They want to dream big, live in peace, and reach back and bring somebody along and touch somebody's life who is in need. There is a way forward. There is a way to share the American dream. There is a way to protect lives and livelihoods while welcoming all. There is a way to celebrate our greatness and goodness and hope that Los Angeles stands for. Do not listen to those who believe that change is not possible. In today's Wall Street Journal, and I wasn't going to do this, but after I read it this morning, I felt compelled. My competitor, Karen Bass, is quoted that under her leadership as mayor, homelessness will not be solved in four years. The most Angelinos can hope for, quote, is light at the end of the tunnel after four years. Whoa. Whoa. Well, let me respond by saying this. The light at the end of the tunnel is shining bright tonight. Okay, we've been listening to uh, mayoral candidate Rick Caruso. I I've got to point this out to you guys, and maybe you feel the same way. We we'll listen to Karen Bash. She said the march to victory. Uh, he sounds like he's uh, giving a victory speech. Both of them do tonight. I mean, is there a win for both of them in these numbers? Yeah, there's. The, they both made it to the runoff. This is the elimination round. I mean, it's it's. Uh, it doesn't, uh, the 38-41, you'd rather be on top, but it really doesn't matter as long as yeah. you're in that race because yeah. we reset the deck for November and a lot happens, a lot's going to happen. The other thing that they got me with just the visual style, there she is with her supporters all around her and the, mm -hmm. the shot, you see a lot of extemporaneous going on there. His is very choreographed, I want to say. Yeah, I mean, and I think it speaks to the themes of the campaigns, too, right? I mean, she's certainly trying to, and she said in her speech, you know, my family looks like Los Angeles, right? She yeah. does have a diverse family. They're not all African-American, for example. And so she wanted to demonstrate that and demonstrate the groundswell of support. She's an organizer, used to do this with Community Coalition. And then you have Caruso making, you know, kind of a separate point, very ordered, very mm -hmm. calm, very reassuring in terms of leadership. And, you know, when you think about the voters that Caruso is trying to attract versus the voters that Bass is trying to attract, that really speaks to what they are trying to make their campaigns about. Because that's one thing I was looking for in both of these speeches, and I'll go nerd out about it, of course, afterwards as well, <laughs> watch the whole things, you know, in their entirety, to really hear what they're going to pick up on for the general, right? So this is also supposed to be the pivot conversation, where people start to really think about, you know, okay, what are the themes I'm going to take up in that campaign for the fall. So you heard Caruso talk a little bit more about, you know, attacks, um, kind of saying Bass is this, Bass is that, she can't do this, she can't do that. We might have missed that in Bass's speech because we cut away. Um, but again, there's going to be more of that taking place in How the speeches. How soon do you see them hit the campaign trail again? Oh, uh, very, very quickly. Um, I think the Caruso folks are going to, um, there are a lot of people that didn't vote this election that will vote in November. And they, they believe they still need to reach them. Yes, they've seen the commercials, but they want to make sure that they don't leave a, a period where, once again, your opponent can try to define you or ruin that which you have tried to lay out with your own commercials over the past several months. I have to tell you, though, Rick Caruso is a Democrat now. He was a Republican just three years ago. He sure looks like a Republican. And that's, that's <laughs> the flags. You had I mean, that, the fla I mean that, that, that was, you know, that maybe a consultant will tell him to make, take the tie off or to. But. Um, but, yeah, it's a, a stark contrast between the two. In, in the time that we have remaining before we have to leave the air, let, let's talk about the sheriff's race. And we saw quite a contrast here as well. We had the current sheriff, Alec Villanueva. He uh, spoke last. And we had Robert Luna, the uh, police chief in Long Beach, speak first. I have to tell you, at 31 percent, if that holds, he's in big trouble in November. Big trouble. 
because you, you have uh, a vast majority of, of voters in this primary voted for somebody else. If he was in the mid-40s, that'd be something else. But What was interesting, when he came out and spoke, he really spoke about everything but himself. He talked about the, uh, the recall in San Francisco. He uh, you know, talked about George Gascon, really put him on notice. Um, it, it was interesting that it was quite a while into his speech uh, before he actually yeah. brought up the fact that you know. That's not a good number for an incumbent. I agree. It's not a good number for an incumbent. And I mean, I think the other hard thing when you think about the speech is, you know, you don't run on your record when your record is not what you want it to be, and, right? So you'll see people claiming credit when actually things are going well. And, and, and what I heard have, was him not doing that. You have the voters that voted for the other six or five other candidates now, so those votes are up for grabs. And he, of course, poo pooed the idea that, uh, you know, a board of supervisors could defeat him by throwing in a batch of candidates. Well, now you're going to have the strength of all of those votes as well. Formidable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, uh, that wraps us. Wraps it up for us online right now. We're going to take a break here for just a couple of minutes, uh, gather all the information, get some of the latest numbers, and uh, live pick right now from Downey. This is where our Lolita Lopez will be standing by. We'll hear from her tonight at 11, as well as all our other reporters covering these races. So we'll see you right back here tonight at 11 o'clock. Thanks for joining us.